Our catechism reading for this afternoon comes from Lord's Day 49. This, of course, is in the section of the catechism on the Lord's Prayer. And uh, we'll read question and answer 124 there. What is the third petition? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is, grant that we and all men may deny our own will, and without any murmuring will be your will, for it alone is good. Grant also that everyone may carry out the duties of his office and calling as willingly and faithfully as the angels in heaven. That's for the reading of the Catechism. Brothers and sisters, once again, we come to another Lord's Day section of the Catechism. Those of you who may be new with us in our afternoon worship service, we work our way through the Heidelberg Catechism as a way of remembering and relearning year after year the doctrine, the core doctrines of the Christian faith. The Catechism gives us a good overview. It talks about the Ten Commandments and especially also about the Lord's Prayer. And we come to the third petition, the third major heading of the first section in the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done. This, of course, is closely tied to your kingdom come, your name be hallowed, thy will be done, or your will be done. The two very much work it together. But thy will be done extends the point a little bit further than hallowed be thy name, that God's name is to be holy, and we want that to happen. We want God's kingdom to come, and we want God's will to be done. What is God's will? Well, God's will is his ability to choose. His ability to have a thing done versus something else not being done. We have wills too. Every one of us has the ability to make choices, to make decisions. We choose to live our lives a certain way and we choose... And with every decision that we make, there's an, well, what I would call an opportunity cost. By choosing one thing, we choose not to do another thing. And God has done exactly the same thing. In creating the world this way, in creating you, by saving some and not others, he has made decisions, he has made choices, has exercised his will. And in the Bible, God's will is typically spoken of in two ways. There's first, there's God's will in terms of God is sovereign. Everything that happens in the world is according to his will. He has ordained that it would happen and he manages all of it and governs this world. In Ephesians 1 verse 11, Paul says there that everything is in conformity with the purpose of his will. So whatever has happened is ordained by God. That's the first thing. The second thing that the Bible speaks of when it talks about God's will is it talks about what God commands us to do, his standard of holiness, we could say his law. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 8 says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. Why? For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And so God's will is essentially twofold. There's what actually happens, and then there's what he requires to happen, and yet does not always happen. Now, I want to work this out a little bit, but first I want to talk more about why we would pray for God's will to be done. The point of praying thy will be to, or your will be done is that the, there's a problem in the world. The problem in our world is that God's command is not always carried out. There is a gap between what is holy and right and what actually happens. And when, we're, when Jesus teaches us to pray your will be done, he's saying, 
like you as Christians, if you're going to pray to the Father, you need to be ready to say that you would have his will done and not your unholy will. And you have to recognize and you have to want in your heart God's will versus yours or your sin. It is a fact that most of us, most of the time, want things that are not God's will. And what is fascinating about the Lord's Prayer is that the Lord's Prayer is getting at the fact that this is an issue in how you pray. If you are not prepared to submit your life to God's will, then your prayers will be hindered. This is a striking thing. There is a connection between the way you obey God and how committed you are to obeying God and how, how your prayer life is going to go. This is the massive implication of this petition in the Lord's Prayer. Is it possible that for some of us our relationship with God is stagnating, our prayer life is dead because we deliberately disobey God in ways in which we refuse to repent? Now, Jesus makes this point in other areas of our lives. He says, look, in Matthew 7, verse 21, he says, look, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And it's interesting, if you read this, everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, well, what is that? Well, that's, we could say that's prayer. So those who pray to God and yet in their hearts refuse to obey him are not going to be heard and may even be denied access to heaven. This is a rather devastating concept, isn't it? It's a rather fearful and scary thing. Now, of course, you're going to say, well, the point is that we don't do God's will perfectly, do we? No, no, none of us can obey God's commands perfectly. We can't. And that's true. We cannot obey God's will perfectly. But I, the hallmark of a Christian in the Bible is that a person wants to obey. And therefore, a person who wants to obey God should be able to pray this petition in good conscience. Because such a person wants to align his or her will with God's perfect and pleasing and holy will. Even though I'm not able to, I want to. And this is a, essentially what this petition is. It's an expression of our desire to obey God's will and to make God's will my will. To, to not, not just subordinate my will to God, but to have them be the same. That I, I'm, I'm saying to God, I want that. But again, I want to work this out a little further. One of the most pernicious and dangerous effects of sin is its ability to dull our desire for God's will. You see, we often think of sin and sin tempts us to disobedience. It tempts us to do bad things. But sin's most dangerous effect is that it puts us in a position where we don't even want the holiness of God. We don't even want his will to be done. We prefer that his will be confined to heaven and not extend to earth. One of the ways in which God shows us this problem is by listlessness and emptiness in our prayer lives. If I compartmentalize God's will to heaven, why would I want to talk? Why would, why would my prayer life to him, I can't just want God to ov open himself to me in prayer and have a rich prayer life with him and then the next minute go and act like his will doesn't matter in my life. It should not be surprising to me if my prayers are never answered, if my, my life expresses no interest in denying my will so that God's will may be done. I think we need to let this sink in. 
It's tempting as a pastor to come up with explicit examples of this, but I fear I would get too personal. Do not come here and assume that you are clear on this point. And again, I'm not saying we have to live perfect lives. That's not the point. The point is, do you even care that you disobey God? And why doesn't God answer? Well, look. Now, this morning we spoke of Christ's compassion and love. You may say, well, and, and that it's that is the fundamental way in God relates to us in love and in compassion. But here's something to remember. One of God's ways God loves us is by teaching us that Christianity is life and death business. It's not a joke or a distraction or something light or empty. Casualness in faith is death. And I think this petition of the Lord's Prayer reminds us of this. God is a will. He is holiness. And it's astonishing how often in the Gospels the main point of a parable of Jesus is you guys aren't paying attention to your Christian, your spiritual life. You're acting like it doesn't matter. All these other things in your life are distracting you from, from God. And instead, you're not thinking about the deadly consequences of not paying attention to God's will. And one of the reasons why casualness in faith is death well why is that true why, why can I not be casual about my Christian faith well, one of the reasons is because in order to do God's will you have to deny yours and this is not an easy exercise look at Matthew 16 and I, I read this with you earlier and Jesus said to his disciples Whoever wants to be my disciple must, what? Deny themselves, their own will, and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. Oh boy. So when we pray, your will be done... We are also praying, pray that I might be able to deny my own will and therefore instead choose your will. Now this is practice in the Bible. It's called fasting. We find it kind of unusual as North Americans. In the Bible, people deny themselves food as a spiritual discipline. I don't want to get too much into this, and I'm not going to suggest that we all fast on a regular basis. It's for you to work out. But it's striking to me that in the Bible, the people would have seen fasting as a, a practice or, or, a, or a, a dry run or a trial run or a way of practicing self-denial. I mean, fasting is artificial. It, it doesn't achieve anything necessarily in itself. But I could see that it could be useful in proving to ourselves that indeed we could deny ourselves something. And it seems that in ancient Israel there was some usefulness to that concept. And if you try to fast, you may discover that you may not be able to because your will is so weak. And that your will as serving God will is weak. You're, you're not able to choose for God. And therefore, you need to pray for God's power to be able to follow his will. You may find that. But you may also find that your will to do sin and, and to satisfy your own desires and your will, your, your choice for selfishness is way more powerful than you thought. And the truth is that when we pray, thy will be done, this very battle is in focus. This battle between my choosing for self versus choosing to deny for God. And we pray thy will be done as urging God to enter this battle and have our, the Spirit win, help us win on the side of choosing for God. And this is why Christianity is such serious business. Because this battle is a war. 
It is very, very difficult. It's all-consuming. And the consequences of failing in it are enormous. John Owen, the great Puritan, had a famous saying. You've probably heard it. He said, be killing sin or it will be killing you. It's language of violence. You need, it's not just that you need to do good. You need to want good. And therein lies the battle. And this petition in the Lord's Prayer is at the center of it. This battle between wanting what God wills versus wanting what I will. Now again, we will not succeed in all of our lives in doing what God wants. The gospel news is that God understands that and knows that. He sent his son Jesus Christ to die, to pay for the wrath we deserve for the gap between what God's will is and what actually happens in our lives. This morning we learned that Christ has great compassion for sinners like us for whom sin is such a deadly foe. But it stands to reason that if we view sin as a burden, we would want to get rid of it and to pray for God's will to be done in our lives. Now this raises a final question that I'm going to deal with. You might be asking the question at this point, well, okay, why is it that God allows two wills to exist? He, he, he's in complete sovereign control, and yet it seems that things happen in this world that don't obey his will. Why does he permit that? What actually happens is not the same as what we would call his holy will, his commands, his law. How can God control all things and yet allow people to disobey? There are a hundred theories about this. You could spend, you could write multiple PhD theses on people trying to philosophically arrange this question and figure it out. What I want to do today is simply state what the Bible teaches and leave the mysteries in the, as the Bible would leave them. So I want to do this with three points. Number one, Scripture confesses that God's will is sovereign, unchangeable, complete, and unstoppable, and irresistible. Isaiah 14, verse 24, The Lord Almighty has sworn, Surely as I have planned, so it will be. And as I have purposed, so it will happen. Or Isaiah 46, verse 10, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come, I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. Psalm 33 verse 11. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart through all generations. And most famously probably, Ephesians 1 verse 4. He chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. God's plans stand. They, they are never broken. They're never abrogated. They're never avoided. They're never changed. They stand, and what he commands passes. And even he even plans and ordains how we're, how we're going to be righteous. So Ephesians 2 verse 10, We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So God's, your, the life you live is already planned by him. The good things you do, he knew you would do them, and he ordained that you would do them. That's principle number one. God is sovereign in every way. The principle number two is that man does have free choice and the ability to sin. I call it free choice. I do not call it free will. In the Bible, or sorry, in theology, free will typically means the ability to choose God versus to not choose God. We do not have that, we do not have that power. We do not have the power to choose God. Our wills are dead. They must be made alive in order to choose for God. But we do have something that we would call free choice. We have the ability to move our arms. We have the ability to sin. 
We, our body, our nature is corrupted by sin and is able to choose things that are not good. Man chooses sin. It is not God's fault that you sin. And we see here in Romans 1 verse 18, there's very much an, an, a description of this. Um, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what be made known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. And very, this is very much the sense of man is suppressing the truth. He, he, he does not want to hear it. It's not like God has ordained that man would be sinful. No, man is making the choice. And Romans affirms that it's man's fault that we sin. And now that man has chosen sin, his nature is sinful and he cannot now avoid sin. And all of us are sinful. And even beyond this, if you read through the Bible, it becomes clear that Christians are not these sort of robots that God, that God controls with strings. In the Canons of Dort, it says that uh, the Holy Spirit makes the will which was dead, alive. So when God fills us with the Holy Spirit, our will is made alive so that we choose to do good things. It's not that God pulls strings like our, you know, we're like a, a little puppets with a robot. No, it's God fills us with life and then we choose to do good things on our own choices. We do good because we want to, not because we must. Now, Sovereignty of God. God is in control of all things and ordains all things. Principle number one. Principle number two. Man does have free choice and the ability to sin. It's not God's fault that we sin. Principle number three. God chooses some and does not choose others. And we do not know why. Because you could say... In principle number three, you could say, well, look, if man has free choice, why doesn't God take away all their free choice and instead just save everybody and fix the world right now? But that is not what God has done. God has chosen to save some, and, and he's chosen to pull each one out of the human race one step at a time in time. His kingdom advances slowly. And he leaves others in their sin. And in order to do that, he allows a situation in which his holiness, his holy and perfect will, the will of command, is not the same as what actually happens. And we don't know why necessarily that is the case. And finally, we don't necessarily know why or how God can be sovereign over all things and man can also have free choice in the ability of sin. We don't know how the two fit together. There is mystery there that we has not been resolved in scripture. And every attempt to resolve the mystery ends up in some type of heretical and problematic interpretation. Arminianism is only one of the more famous ways to resolve the problem. It doesn't work. The other part of the way of resolving it is what we call fatalism. Blaming God for sin. God wanted sin to happen for some reason and he enables it. No. There is mystery in why God chooses some and not others. Why some are righteous and not. Why sin is permitted. How much of sin is permitted. It's all why God, why, why, why. That's for him to know and not us. And my final point to finish. Our task in this is not to pray into the mysteries of God. Why his will is this and why that. Our task is to work with what we have. And what we have is not nothing. What we have is the ability to talk to God about it and the ability to pray about it. That's why this, this concept is couched in prayer. Not an accident. Instead of speculating on this and spending our lives questioning God and wondering... Uh, if he cares or not care, all this, oh, all these questions, enough. Instead, pray, your will be done. Lord, make my will yours.
We can read in Scripture what we have. But beyond that, our relationship in this matter is a matter of talking it through with God. And if we have questions that we struggle with, then the best thing to do is to pray them out before God and let God work in our hearts to deal with them. And if we do that, if we, instead of speculate and question and challenge, and we can do those things, God can take it. But if we decide to pray to him in faith, then we will, then through prayer, we will discover that God's love is at the center of it and that the Father cares for us and that his Son loves us and has compassion for us and that we can leave the difficult questions to him because his love for us is so robust and magnificent. Because that's prayer, is the relationship with the loving Father and his Son. And to think about God's will in terms of that in relationship, then it's okay. We don't have to know everything. And then God's will, His perfect, pleasing, and holy will becomes a comfort, not a, a burden or a um, something oppressive. No. It's an immense comfort that the most loving person in the whole universe is also in charge. And that he never lets any of us push him around or tell him what to do. No. The most loving person in the universe who's willing to die for us should be the one who gets his way. Because it's a good way. The best.